title, the title of uh, what we want to discuss today a little bit before our lunch in the little time that we have, hopefully it won't take too long. The title is, Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? neighbor. Of course, as soon as we say that, uh, one particular story comes to mind where this question was asked. This is one of the most popular, one of the most famous, and uh, one of the more important parables or stories that Jesus gave in response to this question that he was once asked, who is my neighbor? And uh, of course, it's a story of the Good Samaritan. And uh, before we get into the story, we want to look at the story a little bit, and perhaps we will look at it from an angle you might not have considered before. But before we look at the story, I want us to look at the purpose of why we're doing that today. So let's go to 2 Corinthians. Our first text is in 2 Corinthians. And we'll see the purpose of what we're trying to do today. Why are we looking at this particular story? 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. And here the Apostle Paul says... Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? So the purpose today is to do some heart examination. That's what the apostle says here, right? Examine yourselves, test yourselves, prove yourselves. And uh, many times in our Christian walk and our Christian experience, it's important to stop to pause and to do some heart examination. I want us to keep this in mind as we look at this story, as we look at certain parallels that reflect things that happen to us and around us today. That uh, the purpose of our study is not the examination of the neighbor. It's not to examine your neighbor. It's to examine yourself. I want to read this from another translation just quickly because the last part of the verse, the way it's worded, can throw people off a little bit as far as what it means. Here it is from the English Standard Version, and it says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Very serious, isn't it? Sometimes we all believe that Christ is in us, but Paul says, listen, you need to examine yourselves. And test yourselves, because if you don't, while you might think that Christ is in you, if you fail the test, that might be a deception. Heart examination is very, very important, very significant. And so as we look at this story, we want to note some parallels for us here today. Some parallels that are very pertinent and very relevant and very close to heart. That's why it is important to examine our hearts. The problem that Christ was addressing in this story is a problem that exists today. And this problem exists today among us as a people, as believers, as brothers and sisters. It's a problem that is current today. And uh, as we look at the story and as we draw some parallels, we're going to see some things that will be, yes, this is happening. And remember, our purpose is to examine our own heart. Who is my neighbor? Let's go to... uh, where the story is recorded, Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. And I know we're all familiar with the story, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but I just want to refresh in our minds the the background that led up to this story. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. Here we have, And behold, A certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? This is the story here, and here is this famous question. And it's interesting that this question was asked with what kind of motivation? 
Self-justification, isn't that right? And he, willing to just, wanting to justify himself, said, who is my neighbor? Before we go on, the discussion about eternal life here, what the lawyer summarized was something very significant. He understood something that Christ identified as a correct understanding. And that is, loving God with all the heart and loving the neighbor as yourself. Eternal life is not based on doing anything. Eternal life is based on a heart condition that only results from the presence of the Spirit of God. Loving God and loving your neighbor is only possible in the presence of the Spirit of God, genuinely. That's what eternal life is all about. That's why eternal life is knowing the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And so th this was the discussion here. And, and uh, the, the point of... Uh, question in the Pharisee's mind, or in the lawyer's mind, of course the lawyer, you realize here, he, he was uh, volunteered by the Pharisees as the next person to test Jesus. You know, they, they had a whole system of trying to catch Jesus. So the next line, runner up in the line is this lawyer. So they go, lawyer, your turn. So he comes with a question to tempt Christ. And he willing, you know, came to tempt him and he asked him this question. Uh, but then the, kind of, the tables turn a little bit in this, in this experience. But this uh, Pharisee or this lawyer, he did not have a problem with the first part, which is loving God, right? The problem arose where? In the second, he says, well, who is my neighbor? He didn't say who is God or anything like that. Who is my neighbor? You see, brothers and sisters, it's, it's kind of easy to love God. He's so lovable, you know? And, and he's, he's, he's invisible, but where the rubber meets the road is our neighbor that we see, our neighbor that might get on our nerves and that might disagree with us or whatever it might be. And this is why we want to look at that a little bit. Who is my neighbor? So he asks this question. And in the question is an implied limitation straight away, right? There's a limitation. Because he says, who is my neighbor? Some are and some aren't. Which ones are you referring to? It implies a limitation. In this lawyer's mind, how he viewed people, he viewed them as different classes. And he said, which, ca which class, which category is that one you're referring to as my neighbor? This is what Christ is dealing with. It's important to understand the background and the backdrop of the attitude that was present that Christ is trying to overcome and deal with in this story. That attitude and that problem is still present today. And so we want to draw the lesson for us today. We don't want to miss that particular part. It's a self-justifying attitude that prompted this question, who is my neighbor? In other words, this lawyer wanted to justify an attitude towards a certain group of people that he did not like. See, he was, he was actually convicted by the reply of Christ. You, you realize that. Because Christ turned the question back on him. He answered his own question, and Christ said, you're spot on. But that, that brought a certain conviction. He said, hold on a minute. Who, who, who is my neighbor here? It was a common custom among the Jews to endlessly debate any and everything. Any and everything was debated. One popular debate is this question as to who is considered as the neighbor. Because this instruction comes from the Old Testament, right? Loving God and loving the neighbor as ourselves. That's what the scriptures they had. And so they had this incredible amount of debate. Who is the neighbor? Who does God mean by neighbor? Obviously, they concluded, the Gentiles and, and the heathen and the Samaritans, they, they can't be our neighbors. They're enemies. The neighbors must be someone among our own people. But with our own brethren, which one? You know, they had different classes and different categories. And, and is it this one? You know, what if they're of the same class? What if they believe this? What if they're of the school of that rabbi? Or what if they uh, follow the teachings of this one? And they had all these different debates and categorizations and an intricate system of classing people and boxing them in different groups. And one particular group that met their own ideas, they said, this is our neighbors here, to the exclusion of everyone else. And so the lawyer said to Jesus, which ones? Which one is my neighbor? And thereby, that attitude totally nullified and destroyed the purpose and intent of God's instruction. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. So, so this is what Jesus is seeking to deal with, to correct, to uncover this problem and, and this almost insurmountable problem. That's what Jesus is dealing with. The national disposition to categorize people into different classes. 
But brothers and sisters, this Jewish disposition has not died. It is still alive and well today. And this is something we must consider. Who is my neighbor? Or maybe we can word it as, who is my brother? And who is my sister? Who is your brother? Who is your sister? Who deserves my love? And who does not? We also today have a very elaborate, intricate, and amazingly subtle system of classifying and categorizing people into different groups. And somewhere in there, we have a special category as to who qualifies to be my neighbor or my brother. Right or wrong? This, I'm talking about something that uh, perhaps might be close to heart here, and this is why I want us all to examine our own hearts, because it's something, brothers and sisters, that is very, very dangerous. <clears throat> to the Jews, those who are not in harmony with them, particularly the Pharisees, those who were not in harmony with them, did not have the privilege of being considered neighbors. They were rather considered enemies. Anyway, the story continues, and so Jesus is dealing with that. And so I want us just to keep this in mind, this backdrop, as Jesus begins to tell the story. And I think we all know the story. He talks about the man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves. They beat him up. They stole his stuff, and they left him half dead, or they left him for dead. And then he says, by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. He came, he saw him, he walked by on the other side. And there also came a Levite, came by that way. He also came and looked on him, and he passed by on the other side. Jesus was speaking. Who was listening? Jews, Pharisees, some might have been priests, and what? Levites. Keep that in mind. So Jesus selects here, and the, the priest was not anyone. He, he was, they were high caliber spiritual leaders at the time. Levites. The Levite was the chosen tribe to minister to God. High caliber religious leaders. Here Jesus presents them in this story as coming, and they're leaving this man. Now, these people were not necessarily wicked, evil people. As a matter of fact, that priest and that Levite might have been on their way to minister in the sanctuary. And in the law of God... It says, you know, that uh, if they were to touch a dead body, they would be defiled. And so the priest and the Levite, they probably actually had a very good reason and a very good justification from the law of God why they should not bother with this problem on the road. And they must have justified it. Somehow, if you think about it, you know, how did they walk by and leave them? Somehow, somewhere in their mind, they must have justified, I better... You know, I have something more important. I'm going to minister to God in the temple. I, I, if this guy turns out dead and I touch him, I, I'm going to be defiled. Big problem. I better not risk it. And somehow that got justified. They used God's word to justify their behavior and ignore another part of God's word. You know, we all see their behavior as quite cruel and heartless. They, they didn't stop to help this man. High caliber religious leaders fail in their duty. They behaved in a cruel manner. Imagine how the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers felt as Jesus is relaying the story. And then maybe they felt a little bit uncomfortable. Well, you know, they might have felt a little bit condemned if they do the same thing. But then it got a lot worse because Jesus was about, was going, about to say the S word. The next part of the story, he was going to say the S word. Here it is, verse 33. Luke 10, 33. Here it comes. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Wow, here is the S word. The S word is? Samaritan. Wow. An unexpected twist in the story. So far, all the characters in the story were kosher, clean people from Jerusalem. Now he introduces the S word, Samaritan. And the reason why I want to focus on that is this, this Samaritan, this S word, generates in the Jewish mind a certain reaction and a certain attitude and a certain reaction, like I said, and a feeling, a strong feeling arises 
in the minds and in the hearts of his listeners as he says this word. And it's important for us to realize and, and understand that. Uh, and, and this is, you know, we see that in the behavior of the Jews towards the Samaritans, how they treated the Samaritans. Now, don't forget, we are looking in the story at parallels that still exist today. And our purpose in looking at that is examine our own hearts and to see what are we like. Do we have different classes of people as neighbor and enemy? Of course, the history of the Jews and the Samaritans briefly, you know, when the Jews came back and they were wanting to build a temple, the Samaritans opposed that and then they wanted to help and the Jews said no and they developed this animosity. The Samaritans already had a temple and they were worshipping there. They had a, a mixed, uh, you know, different nations were mixed there and there was a mixture of races and a mixture of religion uh, as a result and so the Jews didn't want anything to do with them. But over the years, there developed this contest of worship between Jerusalem and Samaria. And as a result, the people of Jerusalem and Samaria developed into these arch enemies. They absolutely hated each other. Especially so when we see uh, different scriptures bring that out. Let's go to John 4. Just quickly, we'll look at some examples of this just to refresh our minds. John chapter 4. And we'll see these rivals and how they behaved. And we will notice something in John 4, that this behavior has not died. It's still alive. John 4, verse 9. Jesus with the woman at the well. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask us to drink of me, which I am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That tells us the attitude of people at the time. The Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. They cut them off because they were hopeless heretics. Isn't that right? Confused heretics. Cut them off, heathen. We have no dealings with them. And they regarded them with great disdain. Not only that, but they actually had a very, very bad uh, categorization for these Samaritans. Go to chapter 8, John 8. Same book, just a few chapters later. John chapter 8. Just so you can appreciate how these people felt when Jesus mentioned the S word. John 8, 48. John chapter 8, verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? How did the Jews feel about the Samaritans? Devil-possessed heretics. Have nothing to do with them. Scum of the earth. Right? Remember, this attitude is not dead. They, these people didn't even qualify as neighbors for the, for the Jews. Forget neighbors. They were enemies. And, and when they were trying to, uh, you know, uh, name call Jesus, they, they wanted to name him. So it's the worst thing that they could think to call him that came to mind was a Samaritan. The worst insult. They, looked, oh, a, they couldn't believe what he said. They said, you're a Samaritan and have a devil. This Pharisaic spirit permeated the Jews, and they justified that attitude of animosity, hatred, and disdain by twisting God's word. After all, they would have thought, we have the truth. They don't. And as a result, they justified hatred and animosity in the heart. And this is what Jesus is dealing with in this story. That's why in this uh, important junction in the story, all of a sudden he brings in this character. He says, now a Samaritan comes down. And he has mercy. He has compassion when he sees this wounded man. And the, the, the reaction in the minds and the hearts of the listeners, you can just imagine what it's like. Here is a devil-possessed Samaritan that we have nothing to do with. He's right there in the story of Jesus. And as a matter of fact, he's the hero of the story. Disaster. Very big disaster. But the question is this, brothers and sisters. Do you treat anyone like that? today. Do you have people that you categorize as devil-possessed heretics and have nothing to do with them? Heart examination. These things are alive and well among us. You realize that. But the question is, how is it with you? 
If someone disagrees with you or believes a little differently to you, how do you behave? How do you react? How is the attitude in your heart? There is an incredible human tendency to look with disdain on those that disagree with us. You realize that? And this is especially so when we know we have the truth. Isn't that right? Among people who believe the scriptures, there is inc an incredible replication of this attitude between the Pharisees and the Samaritans. Today we don't call them Samaritans. We might call them something else. But they hold the same position as a Samaritan. How are your Samaritans? That's the question. How is your heart? Because keep something in mind as, as we look at this as, as we go on. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And, and today, hopefully, uh, by, by the help of God's Spirit, we want to go beyond the covering and just really examine our hearts. How is it in our hearts? Who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? That's the question. Is your neighbor only those who agree with you doctrinally? Is that who we qualify as? Or brothers and sisters? All those who agree with us doctrinally and interpret the scriptures just the way we do. Otherwise, they're on the perimeter. They're on the further out list. Now, remember something. What did these Jews believe? Uh, sorry, what did these Samaritans believe? The, the Samaritans had a confused picture of God. Remember when Jesus talked to the woman at the well? He told her, you know not who you worship, right? They had a confused picture of God. They had a misconception of God. And that's what actually uh, served uh, the purpose of the Jews in justifying in their mind that these people were heretics. A false concept of God. Now, how much more, how much, this, and this is something that really intrigues me, how much more is it with us, with those who don't have a false concept of God? In other words, they believe the same thing as we do about God. And yet somehow, there develops this attitude that we still treat some people as Samaritans. And we might treat them as Samaritans, not outwardly. We're too good to do that. That's too obvious. In here. So how is it with you? How is it with me? There's a lot of silence. That's good. I hope you examine your heart. You know, that, uh, it, it, that's important. And, and, and just remember, don't examine your neighbor's heart. You can't do that. The problem today, brothers and sisters, is this. We have made doctrinal interpretations of some passages a test whereby we categorize people into different boxes. And in so doing, we justify all manner of evil, just like the Pharisees. That's how they were. That's how things continue to be. And uh, this animosity that existed there sometimes exists today. Isn't that right? You know, I, I catch myself sometimes as a Pharisee. You know, I look at my heart and come across, we travel a fair bit, you come across all kinds of ideas and all kinds of people having all kinds of ideas, some of them rather strange, in my opinion. And there's a human tendency to identify the belief with the person and not distinguish between the two. And if the idea is strange and weird and far out, all of a sudden the person is strange and weird and far out. And we discover that it's actually better to put great distance between us and them. Now, unfortunately, some people are a bit fanatical with their ideas. They make it really hard for you to distinguish between them and the idea. Because every time you see them, that's all they talk about. So that if you, if you don't want to hear it, you have to keep your distance. And unfortunately, but sometimes, brothers well, and sisters, we go too far the other way. And that's what I want to examine. Who is our neighbor? Is the neighbor only the one who lives on our street? Who subscribes to the same ideas and same concepts, gets with the program. If he lives on this other street, no, no, that's not a neighbor. If he's in another neighborhood, whoa, definitely not on my street, not my neighbor. We think that way many times. How is it with you and me? And so Christ is dealing with this attitude. That's why he brings in the Samaritan. He's trying to uncover a problem, an attitude problem that exists in the heart of the lawyer and in the heart of the Pharisees and the heart of the Jews and sometimes in the hearts of his people today who profess to be his. Remember, these Jews were the professed people of God. 
They were the guardians of the scriptures. The ones who upheld the truth. <clears throat> I want us to examine some of these attitudes a little bit because, like I said, these parallels exist today. And uh, in order to appreciate what Jesus was trying to correct, it's important to understand the attitude. What, what is the attitude like? What is this Pharisaic attitude like? We'll look at some aspects here. One of them, the Pharisaic attitude loved to condemn. The Pharisees loved to condemn. Almost any and everything they condemned. You look at the example of Christ. They condemned Christ for everything. Where he was born. How he was born. What he said. Who he hung out with. Who he visited. The people that came to listen to him. His disciples. It's everything about Christ that the Pharisees could grab a hold of. They condemned. It is an attitude that loves to see fault everywhere. Attitude. How is our attitude? Let's look at some examples. Matthew 9. Wow. Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> Verse 11. Matthew 9, 11. Matthew chapter 9, verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Why? Why is he going there with these people? Why is he hanging out with these sinners? And other verses says they murmured. They whispered. And they, they went on and on and on. Why? Why does this brother go to this meeting? Why are you attending that camp? You shouldn't go there. They're sinners. They're heretics. Why are you listening to that message? Why are you giving that DVD out? I can't believe you're still on that mailing list. Whatever it might be, brother, says, why, why, why? There, it's an attitude that loves to see fault and condemn, condemnation. And the condemnation is because of the company that is kept. You're hanging out with the wrong people. You're going to the wrong meetings. You're listening to the wrong preachers. You're reading the wrong books. Why are you doing that? And there's a lot of murmuring that happens. Right or wrong? You know what I'm talking about? This is an attitude that is very prevalent to this day. The same Pharisees today condemn others for a lot of these things. Which meetings they attend, which camps they go to, people they hang out with, which DVDs they watch, which DVDs they share. It's a dangerous spirit. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you a story. This happened to me once. <coughs> and uh, like I said, you know, sometimes I find myself a Pharisee in my experience. But this one time, this person was very upset with me because I was going to go and attend a particular camp. But uh, woe of woes, I wasn't just going to attend that camp. I was going to speak at that camp. Whoa, this, this person was very upset. He was very aggrieved with me. How can you go and hang out with these people? They're heretics. And, and, and you're speaking at the camp. I said, yeah, we'll go and share you know, the truth. It's, it's an opportunity to share with the people the truth. No, but these other speakers, they are heretics. How can you speak there and these other speakers? That means you endorse their teachings. And this person was very upset. He was very genuinely upset. All he could see in the camp was problems. Publicans and sinners, and I shouldn't go there. Well, I went to this camp, and like I said, this person wasn't very happy, but it really made me ponder and wonder, what kind of attitude do we have in our hearts towards certain things? How do we behave? That's just an illustration. There are many variations of that scenario. Some of you might be able to tell a story if you were given the chance. Whether on this side or that side, you might be that person who's upset. You might be a person who has been, someone else is upset at you. But think of Christ and what Christ did. Did, did. did Christ hanging out with sinners endorse their behavior? Did Jesus preaching in the synagogue mean that he agreed with all the doctrines that were preached by all these elders and leaders there? Not at all. Brothers and sisters, we have an attitude problem that comes in. And I want you to examine your heart. I want me to examine my heart as well. And we treat people differently based on these things. You realize that? 
they move from one box to another. Somewhere there in the deep recesses of our mind, we have the ruler where people belong. Oh, this is this brother. He's in this box. Oh, this sister. Yep. Oh, they went to this one. They now move from this box to this box. Oh, they move back now. They don't go anymore. Or whatever it might be. Brothers and sisters, that is a dangerous spirit. We need to wake up. That's a very, very dangerous spirit. Because what develops in us is an attitude of disdain. An attitude of disdain towards people. That is very dangerous. Not only that, we begin to shun each other, not talk to each other. And God forbid, begin to speak evil of those that we class as heretics. All the while justifying ourselves that, of course, they are wrong. And they deserve it. We turn into cruel Pharisees sometimes in our hearts. That's why we're asking the question, who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Another common attitude with the Pharisees is in Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. What was Jesus dealing with in this parable? Here's another attitude that he was trying to address. Luke 20 and verse 20. Luke 20 and verse 20. And they watched him and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. They sent spies to ask him questions. Well, this attitude is the attitude of word catching. They tried to catch Jesus in his words. And if he wasn't saying the words they wanted him to say, that was easy. They had these spies to go and ask him just the right questions so that he would say what they wanted. Now keep in mind, like I said, this attitude is present here. A spy is someone who pretends to be what he really is not, correct? And the purpose, they feign themselves as just men and they would go and ask him questions and try and grab a hold of his words. Amazingly enough, today there is an attitude where questions sometimes are asked, not for the purpose of obtaining and learning the answer, but in order to condemn and catch the person in whatever they say. You know what I'm talking about? That's a Pharisaic attitude. Because you're not honest. You're acting the part of a spy. Your purpose in asking the question is not to learn the answer. You're not interested in the answer. Your purpose is to draw something from, the, from that one you're asking to condemn him or her and therefore justify your attitude towards them. That's really what's happening, right? It happens among us, brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, I catch myself sometimes asking questions like that. And you know what's worse? Sometimes these questions are asked and the answers that are obtained are repeated in order to confirm that attitude, not only in the person's heart, but in the hearts of others. Well, do you know what this brother said? I asked him. He said this and this and this and this. Hmm. It happens. Many times out of context, particularly. Here's a news flash. Do you do that? You're a Pharisee. Do I do that? I'm a Pharisee. Heart examination. Who's your neighbor? How do we behave? As a matter of fact, this, this, this problem is so prevalent among us, sadly, and... and, and you know, sometimes you have to address things and step on some people's toes, but what can you do? We need to address it. We need to wake up to reality. Sadly, some people will develop this attitude and it will become the way they obtain subject matter for their preaching and for their sermons. In other words, the preaching and the sermons consists in exposing the heretics, Right? Catching the words of others and using them as the subject matter for preaching. And it's like they're in this, on this hunt. They will watch DVDs and, and read newsletters and watch sermons, not to see what's being said. It's to catch something. Oh, yeah, here's, I can use that one and that one and that one. There are ministries that are built on that. You realize that? And you know what? I look in my experience and I'm ashamed to tell you. Sometimes I did that. 
Oh yeah, look, we can show this brother wrong here and here and here and here and here. And it's like, there's not, isn't there subject matter in the Bible to talk about? It's like, if you can't catch something wrong, you, you don't know what to preach about. It's a dangerous attitude, brothers and sisters. And sadly, this happens among us when we agree on 99 things out of 100, and the difference might be one. And on that one, like the saying goes, we make a mountain out of a molehill. We descend into Samaritans and Jews, right? So how is it with you? How is it with me? Sadly, this is something over, over the years I have uh, noticed. And like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a journey too, and I'm examining my heart too. That's why I want us all to do that. Examine your heart as well. Sadly, and at times I have come to the conviction that many, much of this behavior is actually based on personal animosity. Much of this attitude and this behavior is actually based on personal animosity. That's how it was with the Pharisees. They actually hated the Samaritans. But that's a little bit too close to home. So how can you justify that? You must have a cover. You must have a mask for that. And so that personal animosity is covered with a mask of zeal to defend the truth, brother. You know what I'm talking about? Look at the Pharisees. They hated Jesus. He was the new guy on their turf, not interested in that. And he was stealing the show. They hated him. They absolutely hated him. What did they use to condemn him? The law. The Bible. They used the Bible. They twisted the Bible to justify their hatred and animosity of him. And today, we use our Bible interpretations to justify hatred and animosity for others that don't qualify as neighbors. How is our attitude? This is an attitude search. The Jews said to Pilate, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die. Was that the real reason why they wanted him dead? I have a text, and by my interpretation of this text, you're a heretic. It's an attitude problem. You know, I might be going on about it, but I really want to go deep in our hearts, in your heart, in my heart. You understand what I'm talking about? It's an attitude problem that Jesus was dealing with in this parable, in this story. So let's be honest and not deceive ourselves. Jesus said, <coughs> this categorization of loving your neighbor and hating your enemy is not what I want you to do. He said, I want you to love your enemies. And loving your enemies, brothers and sisters, I want, to, I want to challenge something else here. Loving your enemy does not mean you behave cordially towards them when you see them. We're too good at doing that. You see this brother on Sabbath, and inside you groan. Or this sister. And, and you, you, have, you have a problem with this brother or this sister. Maybe because they believe differently. Maybe because they're a bit obnoxious. Maybe it's just, I don't know. But the challenge is, how is your attitude? How is your heart? And we'll go up to them and we'll smile and we'll say, Happy Sabbath, brother. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you. you. You know it's not good to see them. You don't feel that way. You wish you wouldn't see them, right? Just, they just happen to be there. So the cordial thing to do is to behave that way. And, and we think, oh, yeah, I'm loving my neighbor. Let's, let's eliminate the mask. Let's go deep in our heart. How is the heart attitude? Loving your enemy is about the condition of your heart, not how you act outside. We can all pretend on Sabbath, dress nice and smile. Who's going to tell? No one can tell. But how is your heart? How is my heart? That's what we want to examine. And no one will know that. That's why well, this is not a, a, you know, a, an exposure of, of you. It's just you know your heart. God knows your heart. Examine it. Test it. That's what Paul says. See if you're in the faith. Jesus said to love our enemies. Like I said, I catch myself sometimes doing that. Do you? You know, I look at my, look at my I say, you know, I, I don't feel really like I'm telling this brother or sister. So let's, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. One other attitude that's common. Oh boy, the time is running. The cutoff mentality. You know, it said the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. One way to punish these people that don't agree with us, that we resort to, one punishment is to deprive them of our presence and the privilege of talking to us. And so we cut them off. 
We will, we will reprove them and reprimand them by withdrawing from them. This, this privilege of speaking to us, we will, we will withhold that from them. And that's a way to express our disdain, animosity, disagreement, or maybe just our protest. But how is our heart in the process? That's the, ch that's the question. How is your heart? Be careful of that spiritual pride and disdain that develops towards someone who might think different. Now, this is not to determine who's right and who's wrong doctrinally. That's not what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with our heart attitude here. You with me? That's, that's, the, that's the important thing to keep in mind. You know, sometimes the attitude today is, I have no dealings with devil people. Devil-possessed Samaritans who believe all kinds of heresies. Beware of the Pharisaic spirit. It's a proud and self-justifying spirit. The Pharisees, Jesus said, they loved to be greeted in the markets and to be recognized in public, right? They loved to be called rabbi, rabbi, or master, master, teacher, teacher. They liked to be held in high esteem in the eyes of the people as expositors of the law, as religious standards that people should follow. They like to be concerned, learned, and wise, and a reference. They like to be considered gifted with special discernment and understanding. That's what the Pharisees were. And today we need to watch for that as well. Do you like to be the authority on what the Bible says? Do you not like it when people disagree with you? Do you like to be called rabbi, rabbi, pastor, pastor, elder, elder, right? Because with that, there is all the connotations, authority, and, and yet I, I said it, or you disagree with me. That these are things that happen among us today. Are you one of them? Who is your neighbor? Now, someone might sit there and think, oh, yes, I know who this brother is talking about. I know who he means. I know he didn't mention names, but I think I know who he's talking about. Let me assure you, I'm talking about you. <laughs> Each and every one of you who are thinking that. And me. You with me? I'm not, I'm not you know, sometimes people read things. It's so, it's amazing. This is a heart-searching examination. Oh, yeah, I can think of someone who qualifies. Yeah, and this brother. Yeah, and all these people that he's talking about. And we miss number one. So I'm dealing with number one, okay? That's a, that's a temptation to just eliminate the, not me, someone else. And sometimes people, you know, say amen loudly as a deflection process, you know? Deflect the conviction. Amen. It's like, yeah, I agree with that. It's not me. I'm not one of those people condemned. Just, I know who he's talking about. Amen. Heart examination, okay? <laughs> Heart examination. And uh, another thing uh, that, that will very uh, commonly happen when sharing something like that close to the heart is a resistance to, to what's being said. Someone will hear this and self will rise up and justify the very things that we're talking about from the Bible. I don't know who is what, but I realize that that's a common reaction. You see, the Pharisaic spirit does not yield when evidence is presented. When conviction comes, the Pharisaic spirit rises up against the conviction and justifies their behavior and their attitude. Remember the story of the blind man who was healed by Christ? And the Pharisees grabbed him and they said, how were you healed? And he told them. And that, that's a pretty strong evidence. But they wanted to put that evidence out of sight, that conviction they had to deal with. So they said, no, 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 bring his parents. Was, this, was his, he born blind? And they were very intimidating. The parents, was, we don't know, ask him. Yeah. He's, he's old enough. And so they go to the man and ask him, tell us, how, come on, tell us, how, how were you healed? And so he tells them again. And, and on and on it went. What was happening? They were fighting conviction. They were trying to silence the evidence. Don't be... One who fights conviction. And, trying to, and they tried to justify what was happening. They said, tell us again. And so the man, God bless him. I love that story. He said, you know, do you want to be his disciples as well? I told you already. And they said, they, 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 almost, like, they almost swore at him. Yeah. They said, well, what do you be his disciples? We, we are from Moses. We know Moses. What's this man? We don't know who this man is from. So he told them, you don't know where he's from? And he opened my eyes. This has never been heard of in the world. If this man were not of God... He could do nothing. Man, that was a convicting statement. What did they do? They kicked him out. Get out of here, you sinner. That's what they did. 
They fought conviction and they removed the evidence. And you know what they used? Moses. We know Moses. We have the Bible. Who do you think you are? Get out of here. So be careful. Lest you also twist the scriptures to remove conviction. Maybe the Spirit is convicting you that you, you're a bit like that. Be careful. Because, you know, sometimes we use scriptures. One of those scriptures, I think, is, is a few of them. You know, what concord hath Christ with Bilial? Someone might say, oh, what, brother, you know, what concord hath Christ with Bilial? So, and, and we use that to justify our attitude towards someone that we class as a Samaritan. We make people who don't believe like us infidels to justify our attitude. Do you realize that? Infidels. That's what the verse says. You know what an infidel is? It's an unbeliever. Or someone who believes different to you. We, in order to justify that attitude, we attribute the worst category. See, that's of the devil. That's a heresy of Satan. I have nothing to do with that. And we use the scriptures to justify what rises up here. So beware, be careful. Let's not do that. I know many people, many people today who have had a sad falling out because they went to a camp meeting that someone didn't like. They get punished for it. Or they attended a certain you know, meeting. Or they're... So, and a lot of people, not just a few, a lot of people that has happened to. And there's a lot of pain that is associated with that. Brothers and sisters, that is, that is sad. If they attend a camp meeting or if they even advertise a certain camp meeting, if they happen to be on the speaking schedule with God, with God forbid, someone that is considered a heretic, they get cut off. And I've had people come to me and tell me stories that shocked me. And you know why they shocked me? Because I saw myself at some point doing the same thing. Tell you a very quick example here. Our time is ooh, lunch time. Our time is up. We're almost there. Can you hold on just a little bit longer? Sometimes to get a little deeper, we just have to take a little longer. So, one time I was I was in a meeting, and uh, and uh, this is a really almost trivial thing, but it reveals an attitude. And there was this this brother, and he was wanting to utilize a projector. There was a projector, one of those. Uh, and, and the discussion was, oh, but well, he doesn't believe this. And, and, and the decision was, no, we won't help him by providing the projector. I was in that meeting. And you know what I said? Nothing. Nothing. Because I thought, yeah, well, you know, well, if we send the projector, maybe if we give the projector, that means we are endorsing what he's saying. What he's saying is wrong. We don't want to have any part of it, so we don't want to endorse. No, no, we won't give the projector. What if that man was lying half dead on the road? You, you understand what I mean? There are attitudes, brothers and sisters, that we treat people in a way based on the Bible, our interpretation of the Bible, and nullify what Jesus is saying. He says, listen, love your neighbor. The whole purpose of me coming and the gospel, I want to teach you something. Here it is. Everyone will know that you're my disciples. Love, love each other. And, and each other and the neighbor category, your enemies, your neighbor. There's no categories. Those that you think are your enemies, love them. In your heart, an attitude in the heart. Doesn't mean endorse and agree with them. Doesn't mean uh, go promote their ideas and doctrines, but your heart attitude. How is it? That's the danger many times because, because of differences. I mean, I can't like this. Some people believe differently. Here, when differences exist, all too often the temptation comes in and, and there is a problem that arises in heart. Heart problems develop when differences and disagreements are there. Heart problems. So we need the heart surgeon. Just remember, brothers and sisters, you know, both sides are guilty of this. Both sides. I'm not talking about one group and the other group. It's both sides. Remember one time, Jesus was going to Jerusalem, and he was going to pass through Samaria. The Samaritans found out. They heard he's going to Jerusalem. You know what they did? They said, you're not welcome here. You're not coming. You're going there? Can't come here. You're going to that camp? You're not welcome in this camp anymore. Since when? Has God set us up as the conscience for someone else? Beware of acting the part of the conscience for someone else. Where do you go? Where do you attend? Where have you been? Who did you talk to? What did he say? That's present among us. You realize that? Rome had a way of dealing with such heretics. What did they do? 
They burn the heretics, right? Today, we burn heretics as well. And we use this fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And we burn those heretics like they deserve because they believe unlike we do. It's a heart attitude. Sometimes this attitude is hidden. Matthew 23. It's hidden under a cloak. Matthew 23 reveals this cloak. Matthew 23. Almost there. Matthew 23. Sometimes this attitude, and sometimes we will smother the conviction with an impressive zeal. Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Impressive zeal, compassing sea and land to make one proselyte. But that impressive zeal can actually mask and cover a problem, maybe a conviction. These Pharisees, they compass land and sea to bring one convert to their ideas and attitudes, not to Christ. Right? Sometimes we are very zealous to bring people to our own persuasion, to our own way of thinking, to our own way of interpreting scriptures, to our own way of seeing certain things, not to Christ. And in so doing, when we, are, when we meet with a measure of success, we think we're on the right track. Right? And, and it's like there is a clash of, uh, we, we argue about ideas and, oh, this brother now believes this. Oh, he's, he's converted. He, and what we mean is, he accepted our way of interpreting certain passages of Scripture. Yeah. And the problem, this exists even in the church. We think intellectual assent to truth is equivalent to conversion to Christ. It is not. Amen. Just because you accept something in your mind that is right doesn't mean your heart has been changed and Christ is in it. And this is why the church gets crammed full with intellectual converts, not hard converts. How is it among us? How is our proselytizing? Sometimes people go to great lengths going here and there, and they justify all that. Yes, we are preaching and sharing the truth. And the truth to them is their pet theory or their pet idea, their pet interpretation, not Christ. Jesus said doing so results in the convert being twice the child of hell. He wasn't just speaking to them, you know. What's the modern application of this verse? You, have you ever thought about that? Where does this verse apply today? Remember Jesus told the Pharisees, you are of your father who? The devil. The devil. Why is that? Because they wanted to kill him. They had animosity, they had hatred in their hearts. Beware of hatred, disdain, and animosity developing in your heart. Amen. What happens is you become a son of Satan. And it doesn't matter how many right theories of Scripture you might have. You with me? That's why we're saying, who is your neighbor? And that attitude gets passed on to those who are converted to that mindset. And they inherit that spirit, they inherit that attitude, and we make them twice the child of the devil. And all the while we think we are sharing the truth. Dangerous, brothers and sisters. Very dangerous. How is it with you? How is it with me? <clears throat> when Jesus told them that, you're of your father the devil, that's when they said, you're a Samaritan, you have a devil. That's how they reacted. Rather than acknowledge the conviction of what he identified as truth, they hardened against it. And that will happen. You know, sometimes a conviction might come here, you might harden. Don't harden against it. If the Spirit is talking, I can't speak to your heart. I can only get as far as your ears. If something is niggling in your heart, that's not me. So beware. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10. Let's finish this story here. Our time is up. Let's go finish this story. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> These people that considered themselves the chosen of God, the remnant, the guardians of truth, the expositors of the Bible, 
the kings of doctrine. According to Christ, they were of Satan. All these things didn't make a difference. What made the difference was? How is your heart? So here the story concludes. Jesus asks the lawyer. You know, of course, we know the Samaritan, he came, he had compassion on him. He bathed his wounds. He took him to the inn. He gave money. And he said, take care of him. When I return, I will repay you. I think we all know the story. Verse 36. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? He asks the lawyer. The lawyer could not bring himself to say the S word. What does he say? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. That's the same thing he says to us. That's how we can overcome that. Go and do likewise. That person you disdain, that person you think is a heretic, that person you think is a Samaritan, in the story, according to Jesus, is the hero. And he behaved in a way to illustrate what Jesus intended. It's interesting. He didn't pick the scribe. Uh, he didn't pick the priest as the hero. He didn't pick the Levi as the hero. Who did he pick? That miserable Samaritan. He was the hero in the story. What had the Samaritan shown? If you go to the story carefully, you find two things. Compassion and mercy. The heart of the Pharisee is devoid of compassion and mercy. That's what the scripture says. As a matter of fact, one time Jesus told the Pharisees, if you had known the meaning of this, I would have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. What does sacrifice represent? Everything. All the rules and regulations and forms of worship. Jesus said, if you, you didn't have mercy, if you had mercy and not said these things, not to the exclusion, he said, the purpose of all these things is to bring you closer to me, but you've missed mercy and you just held on to all these things. And as a result of this, it distorted your discernment so that you condemned the guiltless. Same thing happens today. The problem with this Pharisaic spirit, it is the ultimate block to righteousness by faith. This attitude towards others is a manifestation of a Pharisaic spirit, and that is the ultimate block to righteousness by faith. That's what Jesus was dealing with. As a matter of fact, he told the, the Pharisees, he says, listen, the whores and the publicans are going to go into the kingdom of God before you. These sinners, these miserable sinners that you disdain and, and, and uh, treat with contempt, they are more qualified to the kingdom of God because their attitude is not like you. That attitude that you have as a Pharisee, is so dangerous, it might cause you losing out on the kingdom. Isn't that what the Pharisees did? <clears throat> Who does the Samaritan in the story represent? You know, it, it represents Christ. The, the wounded man is, is another, maybe we should do a sermon on, on the other aspect, what the parable means, it was quickly. The, the man represents humanity that was beat up by Satan. And left for dead. And here comes the unlikely hero. Huh? Christ comes and he, 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 restore, you know, he, he cleans up the man, takes him and puts him in the inn and then he takes care of him. It's, it's, uh, there is Christ there. The perceived enemy is used to represent Christ. That's interesting. And here's the challenge I want to I challenge you and me with. Do you see Christ in your Samaritans? Those people that are Samaritan to you, do you see Christ in them? Let's go to our last verse, Galatians chapter 5. Last verse. Sorry, I took longer than I thought. But we'll finish with this verse, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Yeah. Here are they that keep the commandments. All the law is fulfilled in one word. What's this? How is your heart towards your neighbor? How is your attitude towards your neighbor? And our neighbor is not just the person who believes like us or who associates with us or who subscribes to the same doctrinal statement or beliefs. Our neighbor is whoever comes across our path. How does our attitude towards... And I know it is challenging when there is differences. That's why we're talking about this. I know that. 
I've felt those challenges. Have you? Don't put your hands up. Now, I want to mention something here because Jesus says, go and do thou likewise. And that's what I want to leave with you. Go and do thou likewise. If there is something you need to take care of and amend, go and do thou likewise. But I'm mindful of the fact that some of you might have been on the receiving end of that treatment. You might have been cut off and treated as a Samaritan. And your presence is no longer welcome. Now, I'm not saying go and push yourself where your presence is not welcome. Jesus says not to do that. And Jesus respected that. But the challenge is don't be the person to do that. Don't be that person. Let, don't, let, I don't want to be that person. Don't you be that person. Let's not be a person like that. To cut off people, to push people away simply because we think they see something different to us that we think is wrong. Examine yourselves. Prove yourselves. Test your hearts. Who is your neighbor? Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we are sorry that many times, Lord, we act more like Pharisees than not. But Lord, we know with thee is forgiveness and plenty of mercy. I pray, please, that you will teach us, instruct us, forgive us and heal us, that we might indeed represent thee to all those around us, that we might have that divine love of Jesus in our hearts, that we might be able to love our neighbors. And as your desire is for each and every one of us to go and do likewise, like that Samaritan was. We thank thee, Lord, that this is possible only with thee. We pray, Lord, that as we go from this place, your spirit will touch our hearts. I know some hearts might have been convicted here today. They know what to do, dear Lord. I pray you'll give each and every one of us, one of us courage and strength that we might be faithful witnesses to thee. We thank you so much that you love us with a love that we do not even understand, and that you forgive the worst of sinners, and that you heal and build up that which is broken. We thank you in Jesus' name.